Thanks again to Amir uh, for inviting me, and it's great to be here. And I'm enjoying all the all the presentations, and I'm learning a lot. And um, Bitcoin, I think, is part of the emerging global currency wars. Uh, this is an excellent book by Jim Rickards. It came out just six months ago or so, called Currency Wars, uh, and it gives a history of of the currency wars and. Uh, we're entering a period in global finance that's, that's very interesting and very unusual uh, because uh, the, the nature of currency itself is being radically transformed and there's massive changes going on and, and, and um, I, before I get into that I just wanted to make kind of a side, a side observation which is um, one, of the, one of the things I picked up on in one of the earlier um, meetings was this idea of the over-the-counter Bitcoin market, the OTC Bitcoin market, and the idea that people are meeting essentially and exchanging Bitcoins and expanding the Bitcoin universe this way. And in my notes that I keep all the time to kind of, um, I always try to keep up to date on all the latest developments on all of the... Uh, and um, it reminded me of a couple of items from the news last year. Uh, this is from a few months ago. A tied detergent is a new currency. A tied detergent has become a form of currency on the streets. The retail price is steadily high, roughly ten to twenty dollars a bottle. It's a staple in households across socioeconomic cl classes. So here you have, as the global markets are deteriorating, as this uh, wealth and income gap are expanding, as the central bankers are becoming ever more fraudulent. You know, the currency markets are breaking down and they're morphing into these different things. So you see this, these types of things springing up out of, out, of, out of the grassroots. Then you have another story similar. Gum stolen from UK is being used as a currency on the black market in Romania. Uh, after two Romanian men uh, were jailed for stealing more than a thousand pounds of chewing gum from ASDA, uh, they then, uh, this is according to PC David Walton, uh, we're not talking about a couple of packs, we're talking about seven to eight hundred pounds a week. Uh, and this is, he's done some investigative in, uh, investigations in Romania. Uh, if you go into the shop and purchase goods as opposed to change, they give you sticks of chewing gum. So this, this shows you that on the grassroots level, there's already an appetite for, for the OTC Bitcoin market. There's already people out there, millions of people out there that are checking out of the formal banking system and they're trading chewing gum, they're trading laundry detergent. You know, come to them with Bitcoin, it's going to be an, an amazing step forward. It's, it, it's got properties that are remarkably better than chewing gum. <laughs> so, uh, so I think, you know, the, the market is, is ripe for this. And um, uh, to get into this currency war themes now, here, here's a story, here's a headline. Uh, cyber finance takes its collateral thinking test. Uh, since abandoning the gold standard, there's been a shift away from the idea that financial transactions need to be secured on tangible assets. Assets are pledged and repledged numerous times to generate credit flows. Now, of course, when we're talking about cyber finance here, they're not talking about something like Bitcoin. They're talking about the, the, how over the past, as they say, since the, all going off the gold standard in 1971, uh, finance has been increasingly become more abstract. And so we've went from a gold standard, we went to a petrodollar standard. Uh, we have trade informing the global currency grid, the forex markets in terms of global trade. But this is also breaking down and becoming non-existent. You have now a situation, not only that's degraded the fractional reserve banking system, we're going to a zero reserve banking system, we're heading to a negative reserve banking system. And when they talk about cyber finance here, they're talking about practices in the UK, such as rehypothecation. That was a big news during the MF Global scandal, where MF Global, JP Morgan, they went into customer accounts. They stole $1.2 billion, which is a new high watermark in the crimes we've seen over the past couple of decades. Actually, segregated customer accounts being stolen from, from uh, this group. Uh, MF Global, of course, connected to John Corzine. John Corzine, of course, his excuse, his defense, why and where this money went to, he said, well, it went into the vapor. It vaporized. Now that defense worked. He's, he's opening a new hedge fund. There was no prosecution. There was no arrest. There was no incarceration. He used the defense. The money simply vaporized. 
Again, compared to Bitcoin, Bitcoin looks like solid gold compared to this. <laughs> Which I'm going to get into later in a good presentation about comparing Bitcoin to gold and silver, because I think there's a, there's a really, there's a, there's a parallel there. So here you have this cyber finance and rehypothecation. Rehypothecation simply means that in finance, you can loan, you can let, you can put up securities as a loan for financing. That's hypothecation, uh, and rehypothecation suggests that you're relending some loan securities again for an additional lending. And in the states, the in the United States, the regulation is 140 percent of the rehypothesis limit to how much you can rehypothecate against the uh, security. In the UK, that law is unlimited. There is there's unlimited hypothecation or rehypothecation. It's rehypothecation to infinity. So you have the same securities as they, as, as, as they say, the, uh, the financial transactions are pledged and repledged numerous times. <laughs> numerous times, in, infinite numbers of times. These, these same securities are sold an infinite number of times. So you end up with this financial system where again it's negative asset reserve system. Forget fractional reserve system. We, we're, that would be a vast improvement for what we have now. If you have, you know, if you have rehypothecated securities to infinity, your negative reserve system, the, 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 the system is imploding in real time. The, the reaction from central bankers is, you know, in the states, they come up now with quantitative easing. Quantitative easing to infinity. Quantitative easing without any limits. Uh, $40 billion of mortgage-backed securities to be purchased every single month with no limitation whatsoever. Uh, this is a blatant, um, uh, basically, capitulation by the Federal Reserve Bank, who now understands that the, uh, the, the ability to grow out of the current debt crisis will never exist, will never happen. The, there's only one solution now, and that's going to be for printing money, and this is then going to be the de facto uh, basis of what is becoming this currency war, because now you have a race to the bottom. All these countries are going to be printing to, to base their currency against each other to ostensibly help their export market to try to grow their way out of this debt crisis by incurring more debt. So this is this is this is what's happening here. This is the context in which Bitcoin has has emerged, and why it's such a valuable piece uh, in this in this war that's going on. And why I follow Bitcoin, because we on the Kaiser Report Show, we cover the financial war, as we call it, the currency war, and we try to go, we do frontline reporting, we go to Ireland, we go to Athens, we do these, we do these uh, reports, and we try to cover what's going on in, in these wars. Obviously, in Athens, the financial war has resulted in huge social unrest, social poverty, austerity, suicides. You know, we talked to Paul Moore, who was the formerly the top um, regulator at HBOS here in the UK, and he was on the show, and he said that because of the financial crisis that's now five years in the making, there's been a 100 million people have now been thrust into poverty. Of that 100 million people, of course, there are millions now on death's doorstep, who have, many have already committed suicide, many are starving, many are dying, and I put it bluntly, I said, isn't this then the equivalent of a financial holocaust? And Paul Moore said, yeah, basically that's what we're talking about, a financial holocaust. So this is what we're all basically um, facing. And the, the, the propensity of the central bankers and the central planners to get us to buy into this is um, never ending, especially now since there is no ability to grow their way out. I saw an interesting statistic a couple of years ago which has stuck to me, stuck with me, which is that to of the remaining trillion or so barrels of oil left, uh, you know, we, we've already, you know, got the top one trillion barrels, uh, that's, that, you know, roughly speaking, uh, and, and now there's roughly a trillion, trillion barrels left to, uh, to, to, to drill. Um, this is clearly the case, the, the, all the easy oil is clearly not available, you know, that's why people go offshore, that's why people do the oil sands projects, that's why people are doing all these exotic drilling techniques, is because the easy oil is not there to get, I mean, that's a very clear indication that you've, you've reached a point of, of the oil industry having some real economics that makes sense, uh, but now it's becoming less uh, sensible to do to be in that business, but if if in fact you were to get that remaining trillion dollars of oil, burn it, uh, and, and and generate the economic GDP that results from it, it would not be enough to extinguish the current debt load. 
the, the derivatives market, which is debt, is over a quadrillion and growing fast. So even if you burned every single gallon of oil left on planet Earth, you still wouldn't pay off the debt. So there, there is no, there's no, there's going to be no payoff of this debt. There is no, there's not going to be any growth. There's no policies. There's only currency war. And the, and the number one weapon in the currency war is debasement. And, and again, uh, Bitcoin fits into this because Bitcoin actually as a currency is, has got some fantastic attributes, which, which, are, which are similar to uh, gold and silver, which I'll get to um, in a moment. Uh, the currency wars are, are here, they are every day, they are in the news. This is just from yesterday's independent newspaper. Here's a trader for UBS. Headline is, bonus greed drove trader to lose 1.4 billion pounds for UBS. So this is a rogue trader story. If you read into this story, you find out that he was engaged in what's called the Martingale system of betting. Martingale approach to managing risk and, and investing money for uh, the bank. Now, we, I've talked about this on the show a few times. The Martingale system is really key to understand what that's all about. For those of you who don't know what it is, Basically, it's the idea where you go to the roulette wheel, you make a bet on red. If you lose, you double the bet again on red. And if you lose, you double again again on red. The theory being that eventually you're going to win. Now, that's the Martin Gale system. It's a known strategy in gambling circles. And um, this is a strategy that this guy used. And the, the why it's used so often in this environment of, of bank errors and hedge funds is because their cost of borrowing is near zero thanks to central bankers who are attempting to refloat the global economy with cheap money, so they need to keep interest rates near zero. So their cost of borrowing is near zero. If they make a mistake, they get bailed out. So why not use the Martingale strategy? Um, he, of course, at some point, was betting the entire capitalization of the company. <laughs> and he, they caught him, you know, he's been, he, the, the, the company survived. But, this happened to Barrick's Bank. This happened to Society General. The so-called rogue trader, the isolated rogue trader, keeps happening again and again and again. Management knows they have these rogue traders. Management knows that their cost of funding is zero. Management knows that if they lose money, they're gonna get bailed out. So they're, they're given the, 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 the plausible deniability of having you know, a firewall between them and the operations, and, they're, and they're, if they make money, they keep the money. If they lose money, they get cut loose. But it happens again and again and again, every six months, every year, we hear about another multi-billion dollar fraud. But the, the basic business modus operandi of most of these too big to fail banks is, is, is employing a version of this Martingale strategy. Um, the Federal Reserve uses the Martingale strategy. Their, their policies of expanding the money supply is, is, is not working. So what are they doing? They're doubling down. They're just going to spin the roulette wheel again. They're going to make the same bet again. They said they're going to improve employment by using the same strategies that have not improved employment. The same strategies that have caused all these troubles and problems in the banking sector, they're going to double down. And of course, the problem is that when you take a fragile, complicated system and you increase the fragility, you increase the complexity, the possibility of another catastrophic collapse expands exponentially. You know, this is also covered, you know, in this book, it's a great book, he talks about, this, you know, stressed state of, of uh, you know, the snow on the side of a, of a mountain with the oncoming arrival of one snowflake, you know, triggering that avalanche. And that's where these markets are. They're incredibly over leveraged, they're incredibly fragile. The systems that hold them together are, um, are, are, are not robust, and so we're heading now into another major global financial crash that will be a bit bigger than the 2008 crash, which was bigger than the housing crash, which was bigger than the dot-com crash, which was bigger than the 1987 stock market crash, or the Asian financial crash, or the Mexico peso crash, or the ruble crash. These crashes happen predictably and regularly because the solution is always to expand the debt load, create more mathematical quantitative analysis. That will allow us to, we got the math wrong, that was the problem. We'll bring in more guys from MIT to create more math. We're gonna double the debt and we're gonna grow our way out of this. 
it's not working. The, the bankers themselves pay themselves a fee based on the total amount of debt in circulation. So they're making out like bandits. It's funny because 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people would talk about the so-called Hollywood accounting method. The Hollywood was famously an accounting cesspool because they booked all the profits in this quarter and they uh, prorated the losses in perpetuity. So that's your Hollywood accounting method. It, today, Hollywood is actually, the, 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 the accounting is fairly clean compared to Wall Street banks and city banks, which do use that technique of any problems that they have, any losses, are put into the shadow banking system, they're put off balance sheet, a la Enron, uh, or, or they're um, deferred in, in any manner of way, or like the London Whale in London is a good recent example. Here you have JP Morgan, biggest financial terrorist in the world. They've got an operation in London. They've got this London Whale guy, another proprietary guy, rogue trader who's given all the uh, necessary means to speculate wildly, and if he makes a mistake, then it's a one-off. It just happened one time! And uh, well, we bail them out, we pay a small fine. We don't admit guilt, we pay a small fine, and it'll never happen again. So the London Whale is uh, you know, doing this and engaged in, in, in this type of fraudulent behavior. And uh, he's using this exact same technique. And there are, J.P. Morgan, of course, it's illegal at this point to have even a proprietary trading desk. They're supposed to be, and Blythe Masters, who's their, you know, the, the, the witch of J.P. Morgan, who created the, the credit default swap, she was interviewed and said, you know, we don't have any proprietary trades. It's fully balanced, it's fully booked. You know, two weeks later, the London Whale hit. It's like, oh, and again, well, because it wasn't a proprietary trade. And well, the thing about Wall Street accounting, which I know from experience, because I worked on Wall Street for many years, and um, is, is basically you, you run, most, most brokers and bankers run a system where they, they have multiple trades uh, that they have made but uh, to, to, to kind of make it simplified, um, the account numbers for their trades are kind of held in limbo. And um, so at the end of the quarter, basically, uh, what you do is to smooth out your earnings for the quarter, you, you place account numbers accordingly to manufacture a quarterly earnings number that you're happy with. So, uh, this, you know, you call this look-back trading, or we used to call it look-back trading. So, you know, back in the 80s, early 1980s, when I started on Wall Street, um, you know, it was pretty wild. Um, you know, you could just go, in the morning, you could, you could put on 10 or 20, you know, option trades on high beta stocks, and, um, and, and you're putting in, uh, basically, you know, spread trades. On, you're going long and short at the same time. Then you, you leave for lunch, you drink a lot of sake, uh, you come back, and the winning trade, the, the winning trades, of course, they're easy to, to, to dump. You're putting those into customers. You're trying to stop them from suing you for some reason. So that's, that's an easy place to put the winning trades. And then the losing trades, of course, are corporations who need losses for the quarter. So, do you, you, so under executive services division of the firm, you can call up their, their CFO and, and, and their cash desk and say, hey, I've got, you know, this this half a million dollar loss. You can use it as you're reporting next week. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, so that's where those go. And then, so you got the, 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 the compliance officer in all these branches, of course, is the guy who gets the biggest Christmas bonus at the end of the year. That every, every one of these brokerage firms has a compliance officer. He, he's the guy who lets you forge all the documents, do all the look back trades, and um, commit all, all manner of fraud. And of course, you know, the beautiful, beautiful thing about Wall Street is that, and the way the business is run today, you know, they have this standing, standing mantra, if you will, that don't, doesn't matter what you do, do whatever you want, because we got lawyers. And when somebody signs off on a new account form, they're signing off to binding arbitration. It doesn't, never goes to a jury. It goes to a, 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 an arbitration panel of brokers and bankers. So less than 2% of all the claims against the industry pay off in cash, 98%. The, the, the panel says, you, 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 you're, you're at fault, not the firm. And, um, and unless you have at least one lawsuit against you, it doesn't show any initiative. So, that's the, so the idea is you, you basically have this environment where that's completely lawless. What, what, what happens often, and you see this all the time, 
when J.P. Morgan is caught committing a massive fraud, let's say, or let's say HSBC, they were caught laundering 400 billion Mexican drug money, or Wachovia, which is now Wells Fargo, they were caught laundering 400 billion dollars also in Mexican drug money. Uh, they pay a small civil fine. The, the regulators go to them and they say, hey, you know, um, you broke the law. And most of the time the response is, well, it's not that we broke the law, it's that you, the law is behind where we are as financial engineers. See, we're geniuses. We're financial geniuses and we're, we're on the bleeding edge. And we're inventing the finances of tomorrow. And as such, you know, you, the law hasn't caught up to us. So you need to rewrite the law or pass a new law. And many times this is exactly what happens. Congress gets together and they change the law. Uh, we just saw this with Goldman Sachs and Facebook. You know, Goldman Sachs let more than the illegally allowed number of people invest in the Facebook IPO, pre-IPO, and their argument was that the law is out of shape. You know, you have to increase the number. And so Congress said, yeah, you're probably right, so they, they increased the number. <laughs> Facebook, of course, went public and immediately shit to bed with a $50 billion loss. At around the same price point that Gold, Goldman got involved at the $50 billion valuation and around, you know, last year, right? So then they go IPO at $104 billion. They put a 100% profit in all these insiders breaking the law. You know, now it's back to where it was two years ago. Or, you know, when I was working on Wall Street, you weren't allowed to use color photos in the prospectuses because it was considered an inducement. Here, here on the Facebook due diligence round is Mark Zuckerberg with, you know, with Barack Obama around his shoulder. Wow, this is a great stock. You know, like, if that's not an inducement, that the President of the United States hyping and pumping and dumping your stock, I mean, this is the biggest pump and dump I've ever seen in my life. I mean, usually that kind of pump and dump is reserved for penny stocks, you know, five million, or on Bitcoin exchange. <laughs> I gotta look into that. <laughs> I haven't seen me there yet. It's virgin territory. But, uh, <clears throat> so there, that, that was a huge uh, pump and dump, and uh, the results were, were predictable, and unfortunately the financial media is complicit. So, particularly CNBC, which is just an extension of the of the of the P, P and of PR of, of these firms, and you know that's where our show Kaiser Report we try to offer an alternative to that. Since there's only one of us and many of them, I shout a lot. Listen, you know, so, and I, I've got Stacy too. Yeah. All right. So I wanted to. Uh, this is my, uh, I guess I could call it my Bitcoin diary. You know, I'm kind of like sucked into the vortex of Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I first heard about it and I just, you know, started to gravitate toward it. It, it has a very attractive quality about it. And uh, so I'm learning new stuff as well here and I love coming to these. So you know, thanks Amira for inviting me. I consider myself most, more, more of a participant in hearing about stuff than, 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 than a presenter. but. Um, my, my Bitcoin diary since I was at the Prague event, um, I'll, I'll give you some updates here. So my, 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 my internet project, which is uh, called PirateMyFilm.com, uh, which is a crowdfunding platform, is structured differently than other crowdfunding platforms and that is structured more as an exchange. That when you list a project, it's not there's no time limit for the project. It just exists almost as a security on this crowdfunding platform. It, when it gets to that 100% of funding, uh, then there's a, there's a closing. Um, but so we we kicked off with PayPal. But you know PayPal it sucks. They um, we couldn't they couldn't upgrade to a business account because it had pirate in the name. <laughs> so because it had pirate in the name, this became an issue. And then, so I said, what about you know, Pirates of the Caribbean? It's a Hollywood movie, right? Discriminate against them? You know? So they couldn't get it. So then the, my developer had to work around this by a system of payments, which was, took six months to create. It cost me to create that. Uh, and, and then it's not user-friendly at all. And it worked, but it was very clunky. It wasn't particularly you know, nice to work with. So at some point, I just said, you know, I'm just going to go with Bitcoin. So, 
So now we're just 100% Bitcoin. We don't use anything else but Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. So we were, it was easy to develop. We work with BitPay, which is one of the sponsors here. BitPay is, uh, uh, we met in Prague, you know, and it was the first uh, guy to, uh, Tony over there, BitPay, you know, you really got me uh, even more sucked into the vortex that is you know, Bitcoin. Uh, so we, we, uh, we, we work with them, and um, it works very, very well. And a couple of applications for Bitcoin and crowdfunding became apparent. Number one was uh, investigative journalism. So investigative journalism, you know, is something that's not funded very much in the U.S. at all. And so as we have a show, Kaiser Report, we like to have good reports and investigative journalism. So we set up projects on PirateMyFilm.com for investigative journalists. We worked with a journalist in Connecticut named Terry Bool, and um, she was doing a story about New Canaan, Connecticut. So as a, an investigative journalist, you know, a couple of good things. The, you don't, you're not subjected to the WikiLeaks effect, right? You don't have the, if you're, if you're going against a political establishment, you don't have the, the problem of them cutting you off as they did with WikiLeaks. Uh, so this worked out well. It, I, all the other attributes of Bitcoin, of course, are in play. It's uh, the the, uh, the speed, the cheapness, the convenience of it all, all came into, into play. Then the crowdfunding uh, element comes together, and so she was able to raise enough funds to make a film, a documentary film, which we then showcased on Kaiser Report, and then she went on a couple of other media outlets, and she talked about the fact that it was using Bitcoin and using crowdfunding. So this is this is a, a great I think application for for this currency because it's great for this uh, the investigative journalists around the world who are doing stories in hot zones and war zones uh, they are, are going to be you know it's going to be very challenging for them to do stories anyway and and to get to pay them through the normal channels it would be very challenging so th this allows uh, for that to happen which which is great and I think they're going to see more of that it's a natural application I think. You know, we're going to definitely uh, try to sponsor that more. Uh, on the site itself, which we're going to expand to, um, you know, beyond just film projects, that'll be any, anything you want to list at all. Um, not just film, but any, any, any project. So uh, a couple of interesting things came up. We, we have a pro something listed, which is a, a defense fund for Kim.com, who's in trouble in New Zealand with his uh, project, which is... Uh, he, he, he got shut down essentially by the copyright industry came in and they shut him they shut him down and now he's he's incurred a lot of legal costs so there's a, a, a kim.com legal defense fund that we're they're raising money through Bitcoin using crowdfunding then there's also this project which is I guess more controversial which is that somebody put up a uh, you know a ransom a million bitcoins I think for the Mitt Romney's uh, tax returns <laughs> So, okay, that's on the site, that's listed on the site. And um, I got some reaction from the Bitcoin community saying, you know, maybe that's not great because, you know, you're, you're going to encourage a lot of unwanted attention and um, it'll be a net, net negative, you know, for Bitcoin. So I'm, I'm sensitive to that. I mean, so I haven't heard a lot of uh, words either way. The actual response in terms of just looking at that as it exists on the on the platform, it doesn't generate a lot of interest. You know, one of, one of the things about that kind of uh, exchange model is you can observe how it, it's trading, so to speak, in relation to other projects to gain an interest or an appreciation of what the interest is. So even even if it's not funded per se, you can still gauge the interest in that project and what the appetite is for that type of thing. And and my my. So based on the fact that it doesn't really generate huge interest, I would think that the, uh, the existing Bitcoin community is probably making that decision. They're saying maybe this is more controversy than we need right now. So they're, they're not jumping on it. So that, they made that decision. And, and so that's reflected in the current state of that, of that project as it exists on the exchange. I think is valuable information in and in of itself. Once, once these things become 100% funded, as you get to that higher level, you know, they